Hey there, welcome to the First Look. Thanks for being here again this week as we're moving into the month of October. Uh, somehow it's October. And I think because it's October, I feel like I'm giving off in this shirt with the haircut, I feel like I'm giving off like high school gym teacher, assistant football coach vibes. I don't know, like I coach the linemen like that. <laughs> Is that what I'm giving off to you? Because if it's not, then it's just me. But I thought I would at least share it. Share with me what vibes I am giving off today. <laughs> anyway, like I should be on one of those sleds. Okay. Uh, so we're moving into October, which means that this Sunday is uh, World Communion Sunday. And I, it's always a, a fascinating and interesting um, moment to be a pastor and to be a uh, to be someone who's celebrating communion on that date. Because I think it feels a little bit like, um, this will make sense in a second, but it feels a little bit like All Saints Day in this way. Um, whenever I think about World Communion Sunday, I don't think just about um, the time period that we're in now. I don't think about just this moment because it's a this sort of shared experience and this eternal experience of communion. And one of the things that I think about is uh, who's at the table. And I think about that especially because when I'm uh, presiding over a funeral, often I will talk about the seat that has been prepared for the person who has passed and that they now join God in communion. And uh, so that makes me think about that, especially on today. So I think about... Um, us all coming for communion. I think about, um, especially now that we have a worship experience that isn't just in person, but is also extended beyond the walls of uh, of our church. But then I think about down the street, we have this 319 relationship, and, um, and then of course the Presbytery, and then of course other churches in our area. Um, and those are meaningful relationships for me. But then I think about the people who I'll never meet, and uh, churches in Switzerland or Zambia or uh, India or anywhere in between, and their experiences. You know, what is communion like um, in Palestine or whatever, like all those things. But then I also think about the fact that if I'm talking about the, the world of people that I'll never meet, I'm not only talking about the people who exist and live right now. But I'm thinking about that from an, in a, in an eternal sense. Am I communing as an extension with those who have come before me? Am I communing with those who come after me? You know, I think about Liam's great-grandchildren. So those are the things that I, I think about. And... Um, it reminds me, uh, just like we did with baptism, we had a baptism this past week, where we think about those common things, water and wood and uh, a room and whatever, uh, becoming something that's holy. Not because we make it holy, but because of God's presence in that place. And if God is present in that moment, then God is present in, in communion with those very regular elements. Um, elements that, if we were in any of those other places, might look and taste and smell very differently. Um, and I, uh, it's, that's a pretty overwhelming thing to think about that, the bread breaking and the cup pouring in all of those places. Um, and even the words being sometimes a little bit different, certainly in different languages, um, but there's a commonality to them too. You know, and that's a that's a pretty amazing thing. And so we get to see this passage today. Uh, I'm preaching out of Second Timothy, uh, which is still the lectionary, but is um, obviously the, a Paul letter. And um, I chose it because I thought it was just an interesting way of looking at World Communion Sunday specifically. So as you read it along with me, um, try to read it through that lens. The other thing I wanted you to uh, maybe consider doing, I, during the quarantine part of pandemic, I did a series on 
one book, one story. So just kind of an introduction to the Bible, uh, book by book, an overview. Here's a passage that I think is interesting in this book, that kind of thing, kind of a way to get you into the scripture reading. And so I did, you know, a second Timothy, um, week. So I will link, I will put that link in the East same email that you're getting this. And so if you want to, you can, you can review that just as a way of get, getting kind of a breakdown of Second Timothy as a book, um, its themes, etc. That could be helpful to you um, if you're the type who is inclined for that. Um, but I'm glad that you're here with me as well. So uh, Second Timothy. So this is not a book by Timothy. This is a book or a letter to Timothy. Um, Timothy, of course, being one of uh, Paul's closest colleagues. So, uh, again, we're looking at it through the lens of World Communion Sunday and um, just seeing what we pick out. So let me just go ahead and read it and then we'll kind of, again, this is a first look, so I'm doing it along with you. Here we go. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I like looking at the, um, looking at the way that Paul starts letters because... Um, it obviously it gives you a sense of their relationship, but uh, I like um, thinking about how some of these letters, even though we talk about, sometimes we only talk about one human that they're, they're, he's talking to, sometimes he's actually talking to many people. Like if you look at the letter of Philemon, it's addressed to Philemon, but it's also addressed to other people who are leaders in the church um, who he would assume are either reading it also or it's being read to them. But this is more like, this feels more like a mentorship with someone who cares a great deal about someone. And, and I always think of that as, as a pretty amazing thing. Given how much time these folks spend apart, it's also clear how much time they've spent together. And, um, and I like to see little glimpses of what their relationship looked like. Um, and so this is obviously a, a moment where Paul thinks about Timothy as someone, you know, very close to him, calls him a beloved child. Um, so just something to, to keep in mind. Verse three, I am grateful to God whom I worship with a clear conscience. That's the name of the uh, sermon, by the way, uh, worship with a clear conscience. And so one, I don't say the word conscience, very clearly. I can, can never pronounce it. My mouth doesn't want to. So uh, I may refer to, to that phrase without saying it very often. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's what the, the name of the, the sermon is. Uh, mostly because I'm thinking about, um, at least when I chose that title, I started thinking about that little phrase in this passage. And I was thinking about the, um, how we approach worship what does it mean to do so with a clear conscience? You know, what does Paul mean? What could we mean? Okay. I'm grateful to God whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did. That connection I'm going to explore a little bit. When I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. So clearly it was like, we don't want to leave each other, but we are going to. Um, and I, I think that the way that Paul references the ancestors part is, is fascinating, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, verse five, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. So it's been long enough that he's sort of projecting. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you, the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, 
but rather a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. I, I was thinking about it actively, and um, it's not a whole lot, it's not all the time, that people refer to another person's family as an encouragement, at least, in ter- at least from what I saw. And it's obviously interesting from one perspective that the people that Paul mentions here are all women. So let me start with the ancestor part first and then move over to Timothy, Timothy's family. First, uh, you know, when Paul talks about his own ancestors, let's remember, he's talking about people who would have worshipped God pre-Jesus, right? And so they were faithful and thoughtful people and, um, you know, he wants to reflect the way that they worship um, in his own life. And so that's, that's one thing that I was, I was thinking about, just because I think so often we talk about Paul as kind of distancing himself and um, moving himself away from um, the, a, a more Jewish identity and moving into um, that emerging Christian identity. And um, so to, to really look back at his own family and his own ancestors and say, you know, I want to reflect the goodness that was in them, um, reminds us that he's not divorcing himself from the people. Um, he's, um, he's including, not excluding. And I think sometimes it feels like that, that we, we look at Paul or we look at the New Testament as sort of the... Um, it starts to distance itself from days of old, which I don't believe to be true at all. I think that it's in an attempt to be more inclusive, um, which of course was, um, you know, a bold move on his part, because you know the the faith had always encouraged uh, a sense of caring for the stranger or the alien or, you know, those from the outside. Um, but there was an expectation of assimilation. And I'm not saying that as good or bad, just that there was that expectation. Um, at least, you know, if you were going to be a full participant. Um, or just a, kind of a respectful um, difference, you know, like, okay, Like, we're caring for you, but you're doing your thing and we're doing our thing. Um, But, of course, Paul was doing something where he was saying, hey, look, we need to change the way we understand how that inclusion works. Um, You know, when it comes to dietary practices, when it comes to circumcision, when it comes to all these things, like, we need to figure that out. And I think... In, um, in moments when we can we could look at scripture and say ah see Paul's trying to distance himself from um, from that faith I, I think what Paul's actually doing is in in this attempt to um, have others come into the fold and to know who Jesus is um, he's trying to make sure that everyone knows that change comes for all of us right that those who are on the outside of the faith are going to change but those who are on the inside of the faith will also change. Um, that Christ means that for everyone. And so I just, I like the reminder uh, as he points to his ancestors, that that's true for Paul. And then the second part, which I think is fascinating, is him talking about this Timothy's mother and grandmother which I, I think is, uh, I would be interested to see uh, the names Lois and Eunice are probably not, maybe they're, that's what their names are. I don't know if, uh, you know, what their origins are or, you know, like, but maybe those are just pronunciations that, you know, like it was sort of changed a little bit from, you know, going from Greek to uh, Greek to English or something, but I don't know, I can look into that. Either way, um, Lois, your grandmother, and Eunice, your mother, um, looking at their faith. 
I thought one, again, I thought it was interesting and uh, thoughtful the way that uh, he looked at two women in this, this man's life and really lifted up them as these powerful believers. Um, and that, of course, gets me thinking about the, the legacy element that I was talking about before, where communion is, um, is something where we aren't just uh, communing with uh, those who are in, in the room with us or even in the world with us currently, but who have been and who will be, you know, this, this eternal kind of nature of the, the, the table of God. Um, so that plays a little bit into my thinking about, about this particular week. All right, verse 6. Um, Eunice, and now I'm sure lives in you. Okay, verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you and through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a power of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. So my thought is that people like Eunice and Lois were also reflections, um, people that he could try to, um, to copy, who did not have a spirit of cowardice, but a, rather a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Those, they were examples of that, so he should be an example of that. Verse 8, Do not be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Let me stop in the middle of that verse. So, as we know, Paul often writes from prison. Um, so we have that, there's that element there in this passage. And that, I'm sure, would have been a, a, a great discouragement to, to Timothy, thinking, well, this person who loves me and who I love is, you know, could die in prison. And um, that's going to bring me a whole lot of discouragement and, and sadness. Um, and so he's trying to, you know, move them ahead, um, despite all, all of those hardships. Uh, let's see here. This grace was given to us in Christ before the ages began but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought us life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. So someone who is, um, you know, speaks that truth prophetically and um, is a follower and then also not only a follower, but also a teacher. Um, and I, it's, it's always, I think, noteworthy to see the places where um, Paul looks at the eternal nature of Jesus. Because remember, the, Jesus as eternal is an emerging concept. And it would be for a long time, right? I mean, after Paul. So when Paul says... I mean, that's just something to pay attention to. So when you look at, um, in the middle of, this is verse 9b, like the second sentence. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but is now being revealed through the appearing. So we're talking about that. And that's a, that's a big deal, because um, understanding Christ as triune, emerging idea. And uh, th that would be a good example of, of kind of a, I don't like the term proof text, but like if you were looking at a reference text for how we understand the Trinity, that would be a good one. Okay. All right. Ba, 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 ba. Okay. Verse 11. For this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. And for this reason, I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed for I know the one in whom I have put my trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you 
with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. So that's, you get a whole kind of triune thing going on there. Um, and I think it's the last verse, 1 through 14. Yeah, that's the last verse. Then it pivots. So I think what I like about this passage, besides those little details that I just talked about, was sort of the um, this overall sense of encouragement, um, which is, you know, the nice thing about the, a passage like this from a preaching standpoint is that you can go in a, a whole lot of different directions with it, right? We can think about this passage um, from many different angles. We happen to be thinking about it from a world communion setting, uh, which is why it's in the lectionary for the time that it is. But, um, you know, those sort of passages of encouragement are things that we can, that feel like things that we can use all the time. Uh, but on, on some, in some ways, it also makes it a little bit harder because uh, it's not as narrative. Just, I'm saying from a preaching standpoint. Um, the, the things that are hard for me to preach on are Psalms and the letters of Paul, because you're really, you're usually preaching on an idea, not on a circumstance. So a gospel passage, a, a, um, um, some story of, about Jesus or a parable or whatever, like those have a narrative to them and you can kind of pick them apart and look at each piece of it and that kind of thing. And even like the story for last week about Jeremiah with the field, you can, you can work with that narrative. Um, but you have to really find the narrative um, in this passage. And I think luckily Paul gives us some of that. You at least get an idea of um, what's happening for him, even if so far we don't know. I mean, we could look at the rest of the passage, and obviously I will, but uh, since this is a first look, I didn't do that before, you know, talking here with you. Um, but one of the things we need to try to understand is, well, how is Timothy receiving this passage? Like, where is he? What's going on for him? What's the setting? Um, and so, but all we really get from this particular text is that we know that um, Paul is in prison. We know that um, Timothy might be scared about that. Uh, we know how much he cares about Timothy. And we know that um, Paul really knows him. Not only knows him, but really knows his family. And I think that's, again, I think that's a really interesting element. And I think there's something so personal about that. Because many of us, not all of us, uh, but many of us came into our faith because of our families. You know, our, um, uh, our parents or grandparents, one of each or both or all or whatever. Um, some of us, it was something else. It was maybe just our own experience or it was a friend or something like that. That's possible. But certainly when I think about, well, this baptism that we just had, um, we baptized an infant and that infant uh, she will, she's growing up with two parents who just joined our church and uh, they're uh, lovely and thoughtful and, and smart and funny people. And um, the mom of the couple, um, she's a, you know, she is a, in um, therapy and social work and her mother is a pastor, just recently retired pastor. And she was, you know, she kind of co-officiated the, the baptism with me. And, um, and so, when, you know, when you think about the, the passage, I think it says Eunice and Lois, you know. Well, the, the baby in question, Poppy, uh, she, has, she has her own Eunice and Lois, you know, who are, are in her life. Oh, and a Trevor, by the way. And <laughs> who are... Uh, um, who are going to be extraordinarily influential. And when, when she thinks about her life and her faith, wherever it goes, she won't help. She won't be able to help but think about her parents and her, her grandmother, her, her grandparents, um, because that's the way that that faith will be influenced. My son Liam is, has a similar kind of thing where he will grow up with, with an understanding of his parents being pastors and, um, 
one of his grandmothers being and his uh, one of his grandparents both two of his grandparents being pastors sorry grandmother and grandfather being pastors and um you know and that'll be a part of his understanding of faith regardless of where it goes um and that's not true for everyone you know mine was slightly different you know mine kind of developed in, in lockstep with my parents you know like my my parents and i kind of joined the church and moved through it uh, relatively the same time um, and so which is kind of interesting and, and different um, but you know i also think about the legacy of my you know all of my grandparents who were very active church people um, and you know and i think about them i think about my extended family and, and their faith story when as i'm doing a part of you know being here. And my first call uh, at Pigeon Creek um, happened to have family members, family members of mine, I think I told you the story, family members of mine had been members of that church a couple of generations before, like great grandparents, like that kind of long ago, and were buried in their cemetery. And so before I started, and a couple of times, you know, Every once in a while, I would walk through that cemetery and walk by their their um, their graves and, and think about that. Um, and so I think about that kind of legacy and and wanting to do the best I could to honor that. And and so that's uh, that's a very personal thing for us. And so when we take communion this Sunday, that kind of personalness, whatever that means for you, whether you're kind of the receiver of a legacy, or perhaps you are the passer on of a legacy. Maybe it started with you and your kids and grandkids think about you, you know. That's where my head is in this passage, thinking about the ways that we connect, thinking about the ways that we don't just connect in this moment, but, you know, before us and after us in all directions. Um, the people who I get to do this with, who I count as colleagues across the world. And, um, just how we share in that. And I, I like how this passage is like, regardless of how far away you are, you are my beloved child, and this is what I think about you. So that's what I have for this week. That's what I was thinking about in my um, assistant football coach attire. Um, thanks for joining me. Thanks for being who you are. Uh, I hope that you can celebrate World Communion with us on Sunday. And until then, uh, I'll see you next time for another First Look. Bye.